turning aside and sitting at the feet of Jesus, the reason I'm doing that is not just because it's a message. It's something that I think is necessary for every single person that's ever born, that you have to find time to be able to roll your sleeves up or keep your sleeves down and get along with the God of the universe and say, what is going on? Where am I in your plan? If I'm even in your plan, and how can I make sure that when I die and I face you, that you're going to say, okay, come on in. Now, there are two perspectives on this, and all the religions in the world, except for Christianity, says that you can do some good things, and uh, God's the great accountant in the sky, and he's going to add up the good points and the bad points and see if you, you pass the test. If you did more good than bad, okay, then you're going to get in. But that is not the truth. Because the Bible says that it is sin that keeps us from eternal life because we would burn up in the presence of God. Sin is something that every human being has because of the fall of Adam and Eve. Yeah, I know. If you're an atheist, you say, ah, oh, it's just a myth. Well, okay, but you can't give me an explanation of why there's so much evil in the world. Why isn't there just good in the world? Why does man seem to be so violently evil, even worse than any other predator on the face of this earth with the intelligence he has? The Bible says it's because of sin. A marred, fallen creature that absolutely goes berserk at times because unless we're connected to the creator, we're like a, a robot that's out of control and, or it has a software malfunction. It's just not functioning right. But man is dangerous because of the power he has to dominate the whole earth. But Jesus took care of that on the cross. And therefore, it's, it's very important for us to turn aside sometime and to sit at the feet of Jesus to be able to find out what life is all about and what does God want me to do in this life down here. I don't know how many years you have left, but the clock is ticking. You know, when you're super young, we never think when we get older, but the bottle fills up. You know, I was looking at the, this Coke bottle the other day, and, and you notice it's wide at the bottom and narrow at the top. Life is that way. You know, when, you, when you're looking at the bottle and you're looking at the bottom of the bottle, it's so fat, you're going, ah, man, there's plenty left there. But as you get to the top, it starts getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and that's, of course, the place where you're pouring out. Well, life is like that. As you get older and older, you realize that, um, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, I'm just speaking facts here, okay? I don't know how many years any of us have left. You know, I lost my brother, he was only 71 years old. He was going to be 71 uh, in August, he died in April, he died of lung cancer. And, um, you know, he smoked, I stopped at 24, he continued. And, um, you know, it took him. And thank God he, he was a Christian. Without me even prompting him, he only had a few hours left to live. He started confessing his sins to Jesus and asking Jesus to forgive him while he was laying there. And he died in the middle of the night. But I didn't even, you know, I didn't even prompt him. Now, he knows I was a minister. I had a great relationship with him. But I heard my brother just confessing his sins. He couldn't even open his eyes. But he was, he was just saying, Jesus, please receive me. Jesus, please receive me. Because he had told me that he was dying. Nobody else wanted to believe it because we don't want to believe those things, but I'm his brother. And he called me into the room and he said, nobody wants to believe it, but I know I'm dying. I'm going. And um, I talked to him, you know, about it like I've talked to many individuals on their deathbed. What's it like to die? But so I told him about that. And I told him, you're going to see mom and dad because they were Christians. And he, and he smiled. And he said, you know, I'm ready. And then he told me some other things that are private with uh, his family. But um, it's important that we in this life, sooner or later, get along with God. Even as Christians, sometimes we can get distracted. That leads me to the scriptures that are very probably known by most Christians, the story of Mary and Martha. So we're going to go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, and we're going to explore this whole idea of turning aside to God and sitting at the feet of Jesus and choosing the, the best part between the activities of this world and getting alone with God and saying, God, speak to my heart. So now it happened, verse 38, Luke chapter 10. It happened as they went, he entered a certain village, 
And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And I want you to be curious here. You should be curious to say, Martha's the one who welcomed into the house, not Mary. So you would think, okay, Martha is the one that's, you know, wow, she's really excited about Jesus. But look at this. In verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve alone? Uh, therefore, tell her to help me. And then Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Did you ever have your parents say uh, your name twice? When it says it once, that means one. When it says it twice, I mean, you're lifting it up a little bit more. If it's the third time, three strikes and you're out. I mean, three times at a mention, you're gone. Martha got to two. Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. She chose the right part. Now, what was the part she chose? She chose to hang on Jesus' words. Martha was concerned about all the activities around hosting Jesus. And I think of church. I think of uh, everything. Uh, all the activities that we're trying to do, the birthday parties that we're, we're trying to get it perfect, we're trying to get parties and, and hosting and vacations perfect and all of these things, which has a place. But if that substitutes for getting along with Jesus when Jesus says, listen, I'm here, I want to speak to you, I want to fellowship with you, then we're missing something great. You notice Martha's the first one who greets Jesus, and that's great. But Mary is the one who had a different approach to the teachings of Christ. It points me to two different sets of ears in every church. Those that are hearing what the Spirit is saying, those that are really, really interested in what Jesus has for them, and those who are just kind of like their minds are drifting all over the place and every other thing other than the most important thing is to be able to hear from the Lord. You ever had talked to somebody at dinner time and they're reading something? I've done this to Jess, I think. I've been reading something and she's talking to me and I have no doubt and I'm yes and, and then all of a sudden I got to back up and I go, could you say that again? In other words, I didn't even listen to her, but I yesed her. Okay, so we have the ability in our minds to be able to do those things. You know, we can kind of, we listen, but we're not really listening. You see, we're, yet, we're saying things to like, uh, you know, things we don't even know. It's like it, the proverbial guy who's sitting at the table with his wife, and she's getting annoyed because he's just yesing her, and he's reading the newspaper. And she goes, you know, can I buy a new car at $30,000? He goes, yes. She goes, thanks a lot. And then she gets up and makes a phone call. Wait a minute, wait a minute, what did you just ask me for? You see. But a lot of people are that way because of their mind is turning and twisting all over the place with so much activity. It might not necessarily be family. It could be a job. It could be that we're on a stressful job, and by the time we get home, it's like you were, on a, you were in a whirlwind. I mean, you start the day, and it's just a whirlwind. You know, one time I, I, I remember doing sales one time, and, and the first sales job I had was inside. He says, oh, you just answered the phone. And I worked for uh, GS Marshall Industries, and we were doing selling electronical parts. And, you know, it was great because you know, I started work at 9 o'clock, and I'm waiting for the phone to ring, waiting for it to ring. And then it rang at about 9.05. And then it rang at 9.06. Then it rang at 9.07. Then it rang at 9.08. And I got all these people on hold. And all of a sudden, oh, my gosh. And then all of a sudden, before I know it, the manager comes out. It's break time. How long do I get? He goes, you get 15 minutes. I said, but the phone's still ringing. Don't worry about it. They'll call back. They need to part. By the end of the day, all I ever did was hear ringing in my ears all day long. And I said, this is incredible. And he said, make sure that you write down every single thing because you're never going to remember. And I couldn't believe how many phone calls. And that's why I am not, okay, doing that kind of line of work. Okay, praise God. No, I'm only kidding. Um, but it's, uh, anybody working customer service, you know what that's all about. It can be absolutely the most horrendous thing in the world. Everybody wants everything right away, and you're just trying to go ahead and be like, you're, you're like the, um, 
You're like the person that's just uh, going to get bit all the time by the dog that's hungry, okay? And somebody, th you know, saying, you go out and de deal with the situation. But if they pay you good for it, fine. But with Jesus, we need to just say to ourselves, I need to get along with him. That's what Mary did. She hung on the words of Jesus. And I ask you a question. How is your receptivity when you hear or see the scriptures? Now, there's two things with a Christian. Number one, you want to hear the word of God. You want to do right because that spirit God's in you. But there's a distraction going on in your mind because your mind is filled up with so many things going on. And what holds us back from being able to be blessed by Jesus is confusion, stress, our minds can't slow down. We have too many things going through our mind and we can't process them all the time. Now the devil loves to get you to the place where you just say, I got to get to church. But you come to church and it takes you maybe a half an hour to wind down to be able to even hear the word of God. Because your mind is still going on about what do you got to do Monday or what do you got to do Sunday afternoon or whatever like this. When we get to that place, sometimes God has to do something pretty drastic. Not in a bad way, but he's got to get something to get your attention. Because you're not hanging on the words of Jesus. Moses was somebody like that. So don't feel so bad if you say, oh, that's me. Even Moses, the great prophet, had an issue. Well, we know the story of Moses. What happened was he was in Pharaoh's household, household but he ends up killing somebody who's unfair to the Jews, and he has to run for his life. So he's on the backside of a desert waiting for 40 years. And he's tending sheep. He gets married in the meantime. He's just tending sheep on the backside there. And he goes from being this tremendous, tremendous uh, Egyptian who's Jewish, and being hidden, okay, because Pharaoh's daughter adopted him, kind of. He goes from being this, this tremendously powerful man. In 40 years, he kind of whittles him down. He can't even speak anymore. Now we know that because when he's asked by God eventually to go speak for God, he says, I, I can't even speak. And the Bible says he was one of the humblest individuals. So God has to give him his uh, Aaron to be his mouthpiece because Moses couldn't really speak that well. But let's look at it in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. By the way, the priest of Midian, the Midianites were not Jews. They were pagans. So this is how far Moses gets away from the voice of God. I mean, he marries... A, a pagan woman who's worshiping idols into immorality and everything else like that. And he's on the backside of a desert. He doesn't even have his own job. He's tending the flock of his father-in-law. In other words, he's living with his parents, okay? Basically, his in-laws. And the angel of the Lord, verse 2, okay, appears to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. In other words, this was a miracle, a supernatural happening. Then Moses said, now, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. A lot of people point to the fact that, wow, Moses is so great, he saw a burning bush. But why did he see the burning bush? He sees a bush. Bushes don't just start to burn, okay? Especially when they're not being consumed. That's what got his attention, okay? I mean, forest fires consume everything. But he's looking at a bush. There's fire all around it, and it's not being consumed. In other words, God has to show Moses something so spectacular that he stops thinking about all of his issues dealing with being a Jew who's so far away from Israel, so far away from the will of God, he's hiding for his life, like David hiding from Saul in a cave. He's working for a Midianite priest who's the antithesis of wanting to serve the God Jehovah. 
He has to get his attention. You see, we even as Christians can get so wound up with everyday activities in this culture of this world that even when we come to church, we're hardly getting anything out of it. But we come. Why? Because we're Christians. We realize, you know what? I'm a Christian. I love God. But sometimes God says, I have to do something supernatural, get you to turn aside to show you that you are below where I want you to be. I want you more blessed than you are now, and you have allowed the distractions of the world to come in so much, or the distractions of ministry to come in so much in your life, that it's taken you away from sitting at my feet and hearing my voice. Now, as a minister, I've been in this for 40-something years, and I can tell you, we can become so busy for God, and the churches can grow so big, and the activities in the mission field are so humongous that your life is being led by all the decisions of the needs of the people. And yet our own life suffers in the relationship with Christ, and we become like Martha. We're just doing a lot of things for Jesus, and we're forgetting that the idea is not what you do for Jesus, it's what you're becoming in Jesus. What you do for Jesus is not going to make you a better Christian. What you become in Jesus is what's going to change you and transform you from the carnal nature that you live by. And carnal nature is just your desires in the human body and your own thinking and your own brain. That's what the world's following. And look at the results of following your own desires. Some of us, when we're younger, we start out drinking or start smoking cigarettes and uh, you know, the damage that can be done to our bodies later on. I mean, I smoked three packs of day, cigarettes a day from 13 to 24 when I became a Christian. I stopped. My brother continued, and he's dead at 71. And it was lung cancer. That's what got him. And I love my brother. I told you funny stories about my brother. He used to drink Perrier on the golf course, you know, and only purified water. With a cigarette in his mouth. And all the other guys, you know, the bankers, he he was a banker and an accountant, CPA. And um, they used to laugh, Jay, you're absolutely too much. But he was a great, great friend, a great benefactor, a great brother. But yet he chose to continue these habits. I stopped. You see, some people think God doesn't want you to have fun. But in reality... When it gets down to it, you know that smoking cigarettes is going to do damage to you. You know, it's going to do damage. You either end up with emphysema or lung cancer or something else. There are exceptions to the rule, like George Burns. He died at 100 years old. He was smoking a cigar for 100 years. That's what he said, but he didn't smoke it when he was out of the womb. But you know what I mean. There are exceptions to the rule. But maybe God was trying to wait for him to finally accept the Lord. You see, some people that are not nice people live very, very long for the very reason that God has given them longer time to be able to finally get it right before you leave here because the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die and then comes judgment. I've seen really nice people die young, and it really boggles my mind. And you hear me say it all the time, Lord, I know 50 people that you could take home tomorrow, and nobody is going to go to their funeral because it's so rotten and miserable. And yet you take nice people home and he said because precious in the sight of my sight is the death of one of my children because what you call death is nothing but me having my son or my daughter come home to be with me forever they finished the course they fought the good fight of faith and they're ready and I'm not going to allow them to suffer a horrendous death later on in life now that doesn't mean that if you're living a real long life and you're a Christian and you you pick up a disease I mean we're all going to go by way of the grave it's a question of where we go but back to this whole thing, I want, to, I want to ask you a question here. Could you even hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your ear with all this busyness going on in your life to the place where you can be responding? I'll answer that in a couple of ways here. Number one, you can hear the Word of God but not respond to it. And it always has to do with the fact that your mind could be so wrapped up in the Martha things of this life. It could be good things, coming to church, serving in the church, being in the ministry. 
We pastors always talk about this with other pastors because it's not easy to be in the ministry shepherding individuals. We all do this, and we have to be there on, on call 24 hours a day. And we realize that we have to deal not only with people being born, but people suffering. It's very difficult. We're a doctor. We're policemen. We are firemen. We put out fires for individuals with justice of the pieces. We're all these different hats we have to wear. And we see the best of human nature, and we also see the worst of human nature completely. We hear the confessions of everybody, and we realize serving God long enough that we're all sinners saved by the grace of God, and we need help. Amen? Amen. How many people need the help of Jesus? We all need help. So Moses turns aside. He needed a supernatural miracle to get his attention. If you need that, God will do that. I needed that in my life. But it, I needed a miracle because I was dying at 24. And you hear my testimony thousands of times if you've been in the church. But it's part of my life and how God changed me. Therefore, it's relevant. Because a lot of people think they can change. And you can change. I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic. I was a mean son of a gun. I was a barroom brawler. I don't know how many fights I was in. I've been arrested for fighting. That's how angry I was. And Jesus turned me aside because... I was dying. I wasn't on a deathbed in a hospital. I was going out of my mind. But the doctors are telling me, if you don't stop, you're not, you cannot continue. Your body can't do these drugs. Very typical for a lot of entertainers and, and musicians and actresses. and They do all these drugs and stuff. I, you're just going to take you home early. I was 24 years old. And the, the sad thing is I didn't even care until, the until. For me, it was knowing I was going out of my mind and I was probably going to end up dead. Other people, it's just that they're miserable. You just want to stop the world and get off it. You want to get off the Mario ground. Just say, what's going on? Is there anything more to life or is this it? Suffering every day, not only pain in your body, but in your mind. There's a lot more. You see, the danger is that we can continue to practice Christianity and go to church for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and never change. That's the way the devil will want to keep you. But God wants to turn you aside and say, listen, let's sit down. I love you. My grace can change you if you allow me, but we need to have a sit-down talk. I want to do an intervention with you, the Lord says to some of you. You need an intervention. You've heard about these interventions with drug addicts. Uh, they don't want to, and the family finally gets them all together, and they got a doctor, a psychologist, and everything else, a minister, whatever, and the guy goes, what's going on? We're doing an intervention right now. You either listen to us and do what we say and go into a rehab, We've already got the ticket for you. If you don't do this, then we have nothing to do with you ever again. Then, of course, you know, they're kind of like the mother's always going to say, I can't do that. Well, don't open your mouth. But next week you can call the person up. But we've got to do something to get this individual so they're going to turn aside and they're going to deal with their problem. And when you're willing to deal with your problem, you're going to realize, I can't do this by myself. It's one of the rules in AA and all the anonymouses, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, that you cannot solve this issue yourself. You need outside power, of course, the higher power. We believe it's Jesus Christ. But even the fact that an individual acknowledges that you cannot change yourself is enough to be able to go ahead and get the opportunity for the Christ to be able to have his say in your life. You could try all of these other ways. But Jesus is always going to be standing at the door knocking. He saying, why don't you give me a try? And that's what we need. Because some of the problems that you create in your own mind cannot be dealt with, with psychotherapy or any kind of drugs. And I'm not against psychotherapy or drugs at all. Medicines uh, to be able to help. Okay, I believe they can help in chemical imbalances. But a lot of times, what it is, is that your spirit is dead and you don't even realize. And that's why you're so miserable. We're spirit, soul, and body. And psychotherapists and medicines do not take care of spirits. Okay? We're talking about the unseen part of you. 
that is really deep-seated. That's the real you. That's the one that's really troubled. How do I know? Because when you're dead, your spirit leaves your body and you're no longer troubled. I buried a lot of alcoholics. I buried a lot of drug addicts. And every one of them looks peaceful in the coffin. Every one of them. And everybody walks by. He's finally at rest. I don't know if he's finally at rest, but I'm looking at his body and I say, yeah, he's definitely resting. He doesn't look like he's got the straining anymore. He's not going to stand up and punch me in the face if I tell him he looks good or bad or whatever like that. He's resting. But that's what he looks like on the outside because his spirit is gone. What makes you miserable inside is not just your mind, but it could also be your spirit. You could have a troubled spirit, the Bible says. Even Jesus said, and now my spirit is troubled. But his trouble was different. He said he was troubled because he was going to go ahead and become sin. He was going to take all the sins of the world upon himself, he who knew no sin. I mean, I think I'd be troubled a little bit too if I was supposed to jump into a cesspool. Okay? Some of you say, what's wrong with that? I don't like that stink. I can't stand it. That's why I don't have a farm. You hear me? I don't like chicken stuff. I, I don't like the smell of, of that stuff. I wasn't born to be a farmer that way. I love animals, though, but I can't stand the stink. It's just the thing with diapers and stuff like that. But I've changed many diapers with a clothespin on my nose. Okay. But for me to jump into a cesspool to save anybody, I'd have to think twice about it and try to hope, you know, like, oh, Lord, help me. I'd be troubled, and you would too, probably. Well, what do we do? Well, first, if you're a Christian, I want to read a scripture here, and you've got to make this decision on whether or not you can come to church and worship God with your lips, but your hearts are far from him. I want to read a scripture in Isaiah. Um, where am I reading here? Oh, it's actually in Isaiah Chapter 29, verse 13. But then Jesus quotes the same scripture. So put up uh, Isaiah 29, verse 13. We got it? Therefore the Lord said, inasmuch as these people, and he's talking about the Jews in Israel at the time. This is before Jesus. They draw nigh to me with their mouths, and they honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. And their fear towards me is taught by the commandment of men. By the way, that translation should say, and the, their worship is taught by the commandment of men. Many modern translations have changed that to, to be more accurate. In other words, all the traditions. We can make the word of God a none effect by traditions. And we can go through the form. And American Christianity has a lot of forms, believe me. We are the greatest showmen on the face of this earth. The preachers in America and the singers. and We, we, we got it. I mean, we can, we can make the Grammys, you know, we can compare ourselves to the Grammys. We're even better than them. We borrow all the techniques of Hollywood. And I'm not even against it. I'm a musician, and I love all that stuff. Except if that becomes the substance, then you got Jesus in the background saying, hey, you know what? I'm at the back of the church. I'm not at the front of the church. Everything that you're watching in the front, it's just forms. And you worship me with your lips and you're singing to me, yet your hearts are far from me. I'm in the back. I'm, I'm behind you trying to get your attention. But you're so taken up with what you see with your eyes. You're so taken up with your emotions that you can't even hear my voice. You are so trained by television and trained by the media and trained by YouTube to be able to just say, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I like that. But I want to ask you to turn aside to me and come just for 10 to 15 minutes. You're like an adolescent who finally the mother says, please come and see me on Sunday. We're having lunch together. And he's like, okay. And meanwhile, the adolescent's sitting there and looking at the watch all the time. You said a half an hour. Yeah, I know. I said a half an hour. My friends are waiting for me. We're going to the beach. We're going this place. We're going that place. But the mother's even happy for the half an hour. But the God who created you and saved your soul, why would you want to do that to him? Well, it just shows that it's a lot easier to worship God with your lips, and, okay, and have your hearts far from God. That's not in my notes. 
That's just an advertisement for the Holy Ghost. But who cares, you know, if God speaks to us? I care. It's only one. Then Jesus parrots that. He says in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, These people draw nigh to me with their lip and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And then he goes, he says, in, And in vain they worship me. Vain, vanity means emptiness. It doesn't mean anything. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines or, te or uh, teaching <clears throat> the commandments of men or the principles of the rules of men. I love music. I really do. But music doesn't control my emotions. I will allow it if it induces my spirit to have tears well up and I see myself before a holy God and say, God, change me. But if it's just in my mind, wow, they sound like a band in the world. Wow, they sound like my favorite band in the world. Well, then you just basically said, you're not worshiping God. What you're doing is the very thing that Jesus said. You worship me with your lips, but your hearts are not here. Your hearts are in the band that you copy. And that's the danger of all of the musicians, the younger musicians today. If you ask them, who is your, you know, inspiration? They're always quoting worldly musicians. So therefore, they were his mentor. And therefore, a lot of the music that's created today is nothing but the creation of Midianites. But God didn't want Moses to come as a Midianite to deliver Israel. No, he wanted to come as someone that was going to be charged with the presence of God, with the power of God on his life, to be able to do more than just go sing a song to make the Jews feel good. No, he needed power to be able to beat the devil down and be able to set the person free from what held him down in bondage. Because sometimes all the talking in the world to somebody who's bound by the devil by drugs or alcohol or suicidal thoughts or depression or fear. You can talk to them to the blue in the face. What they need is a word from God. They need somebody who's turned aside unto God and sat at the feet of Jesus who understands that Jesus said, I give you power over all the power of the devil. And if you resist the devil after submitting to God, he's got to flee from you. He can't stay. Hallelujah. That's why Mary hung on his words. She hung on his words. And every person in the gospel that heard the words of Jesus was miraculously changed. Comes to mind, Mary Magdalene. She was the scorned of society. She was known all throughout the city as being an adulterer. She had many men. She must have been a very beautiful woman. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. And yet we men chase after what people look on the outside when we're younger. When we get older, maybe we start waking up and realizing relationships have very little to do with you look on the outside. And we're always looking for eternal youth, eternal youth, eternal youth. We always, we always want it, but in reality, what we're looking for is to please the animal nature that we have that wants to procreate. I know you don't like talking about it, but you have a human body and you are part of the animal kingdom. But yet there's something inside of you called a spirit that God wants to regenerate so that you can become a part of the family of God and take on the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. And this body is nothing but to house that new creation individual. The new creation, believe me. You know, I look out here and I don't see too much on the outside, okay, that's really going to change other than a big smile on your face. Okay, but the bodies start to grow old, they start to die, they break down, and that's what happens. But the Bible even says that we know that even though the outer part of us is decaying, we know that there's something incorruptible inside of us. We know that something inside of us that's more precious than gold, that's tried in a fire. We know that there's something being created within us. No different than when you look at a creepy crawly thing such as a caterpillar. They're creepy crawlers, aren't they? I don't trust anything with more than two legs. Really. And even with two legs, man, 
you know, I'm going to trust and verify, okay? But the point is, when I see something like spiders and, and caterpillars, man, anything with that many legs, man, could really, really walk all over you if you're not careful, okay? But to see these ugly caterpillars, and all of a sudden they change into a magnificent butterfly. By the way, I can't tell a caterpillar from anything. It could be a moth, okay? It could be some ugly-looking thing that's going to be created, all right? Or it could be a majestic, majestic Beautiful butterfly with beautiful colors, but you don't see that when you're seeing a creepy crawling thing crawling around. I was just going to say, you know, you just want to step on it, but no. <laughs> now I understand, okay? It could, it could be something really nice. I don't want to step on it. A uh, man's done a good job stepping on it anyhow with all the chemicals. You don't see too many moths or butterflies anymore, do you? We did a good job. That's one thing I agree with my wife. I don't know about the chemtrails, but acid rain, absolutely. And all the pesticides. We got green grass, but we got no more butterflies, okay? When was the last time you saw a beautiful butterfly? How did he escape the pesticide? How, how did his larva finally, how did a butterfly finally put some larva down and it lived? I don't know, but we got green grass, don't we? Well, you pass by my house, you're not going to see it because I don't put fertilizer down anymore. My neighbors don't like it, but uh, too bad. You know what I mean? In fact, I love crabgrass. I've told you that. Crabgrass is God's grass, God's green grass. The only problem is it doesn't last all year long, and it dies off, then you got dirt. But as sure as I'm, it's like a weed. Weeds are incredible, man. You don't even have to worry about planting a weed. They grow, don't you? You just have to plant nice flowers. But anyhow, I'm getting off the track. But I see so many things. But the one thing that God draws me back to is the fact that you've got to make a decision to stop the merry-go-round and find out what true Christianity is all about. It, I'm not yelling at you. I got, I, I'm pointing to you because I'm speaking for my own life. I've been in this for 45 years. I've seen good stuff. I've seen bad stuff. But I'll tell you something. Christianity has nothing to do with the experience of church. Christianity has everything to do with the relationship with Jesus Christ personally and the relationship with Christians. As a spiritual family, just like the, your natural family. You need a natural family. We need to practice serving each other and caring for each other. That's what I've been reduced to. Sometimes Jess hears me shout out when I'm, 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 I'm talking to the Holy Ghost. I'm going to become a Mennonite and just move to Amish land. I'm going to grow my hair long. What are you going to do there? I'm not going to turn a TV on. I'm not going to listen to a radio. The only excitement I'm going to have is when I see an Amish guy driving by in his little wagon with a horse in front of it. There's just something about that simplicity that I don't want to do, but I like to watch it. You know what I mean? Because I'm still like a New Yorker, okay? I like my Panera bread. I like my Italian food. I don't know if the Amish eat Italian food. But I tell you one thing. They've turned aside so far, and you have to admire them, at least in that sense. I don't think I could wear those funny hats and, and funny clothes and stuff like that. And believe me, you know, with my belly, I definitely need zippers and buttons, okay? The real thing. But I'll tell you, there's something about it, though. When you go there and you see that all of the restaurants, that all Mennonites are working in them and Amish are working, and they're such nice people because they work at it. They wouldn't allow themselves to be changed by the culture of today. They wouldn't allow themselves to be transformed by the world. They wouldn't allow the world to squeeze them into its own mold. They said, no, I will not raise my children to be raised in a subculture of Midianites. And I'm using them as an example of those who do not know God. In paganism and immorality. And let them choose to do drugs and alcohol and anything else they want to do. No. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord the best way I can. I'm going to protect them. Amen. What bugs me is we who own homes, and I don't own a house, but I did one time. My taxes, I paid $7,000 a year to, to see my kids go to a public school where they were going to be indoctrinated with immorality, indo indoctrinated to think that God has no relevance in their life. Then I'm supposed to go ahead and wonder at 16, 17 years old, what happened to my kids? Why don't they like the things of God? Because they spend most of their time in a godless place. It's like a Jew back in Israel sending them on a bus. I don't know buses back then, but just follow me here. 
They wake up in the morning, they dress them up, they say their holy prayers, and then they say them, put them on a bus, and they're going to go to a Palestinian school to learn that Jews are no good. And they should be exterminated, or at least exterminate their religion. Okay, you can hear from me now. Done with the prophesying stuff. I had two preachers say, you know what, I want you to come and share my church. And I can't. Because I said, if I, I'll probably empty your church. Because I can't speak anything but the truth. Because I can't stand seeing people destroyed no more. I've had it. I don't want to see young people destroyed with drugs, alcohol, immorality. Being confused about what sex they are. I mean, we really got a screwed up society. When you got a 17-year-old or 18-year-old boy say, you know what, I don't think I'm a boy, I think I'm a girl. And then when you tell them, I tell you what, take your clothes off in front of the mirror by yourself, okay, and describe it, and then a good book, get a book on anatomy, and it'll tell you whether you're a male or female. That is what we've come to in America. It's the land of feelings. Feelings aren't facts. Facts are facts. What you feel like is not relevant to reality. Let me finish it up. Here's the clue. If you want to be free, and then we'll have a time of fellowship. It's birthday Sunday. We're going to eat some cake. There's a carrot cake back there. And yeah. <laughs> First Peter chapter 4. There's got to be a change in your thought life. And you've got to turn aside. If you don't turn aside, you're just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. I want to be changed. In fact, I am changing. I'm losing all interest in many of the worldly desires that I used to be involved in. And I'm not, not bad TV. You know, I just don't watch it. I used to be a massive, massive football fan. And uh, before, everybody stopped watching football because of... You know, them trample on the flag. I'm a veteran, and I'm not into that stuff. You trample on the flag. You know, I was taught to fight for that flag, even though I never fought. I was drafted during the Vietnam War, but I had a lot of friends die trying to go ahead and make sure that that flag did not fall. And you got some lazy people that are out there because they don't want to work. They're on free handouts, stepping on that flag to make us. You want to make a, You want to make your voice heard. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't desecrate the very thing that gives you the right to go ahead and do that and throw back in my face. Well, I have the right to do that. You have a right to gas drink gasoline. You have a right to go ahead and kill yourself if you want to. And that don't mean it's a good thing. All you do is stir up hatred, strife, bitterness, and division in this country when we need to come together as one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we work out the racial problems. Not by fighting and go do stuff. Just sit down and help each other. That's what we do. Like the days of old and stop allowing this nonsensical stuff. And it all comes from ungodly education. And if that bothers you and offends you, Good, because God will one day, he'll say the same thing because that's what he's saying today and you don't listen to him. Because you won't turn aside and really hear what he wants to say to the church. First Peter, boy, it's getting late. First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, in other words, he went to the cross, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts or desires of men, but for the will of God. In verse 3, for we have spent enough of our pastime in doing the will of the Gentiles. And what is the will of the Gentiles? It's just a free-for-all, do whatever you feel like doing. You walked in lewdness and lusts. Think of Hollywood. Think of all of these, these uh, uh, media stars that are multimillionaires that buy uh, sexual favors from young ladies that are trying to break into industries or get somewhere in the business world. Don't you realize that when you do that, you're receiving the mark of the beast? 
You can't buy or sell unless you go ahead and you go ahead and do these things. We're all part of this, this, this whole mess down here. Sooner or later, you get to the place, if you've got any sense in your mind saying, there is something drastically wrong here. I need to find out. Well, I'll tell you where to go. Go to God and say, God, you created this thing. How is the way out of this? I want out of this, God. And he will come. He never turns away somebody with that kind of veracity within their heart and passion to know him. He said, you will find me, says the Lord, if you search for me with all of your heart. Seek me and you will find me. And then Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And I guarantee you, if you're a drug addict, you're miserable in your mind, all you need is a supernatural touch of God. On the mountaintop, and God will show you the burning bush if he had to. And that burn will burn inside of you to the place where it will radically change your life. But you've got to be willing to turn aside. And I think this is for some of us who are Christians for a long time. Where you finally got to say, you know what? I'm taking a sabbatical. And a sabbatical is a time of rest where you do nothing. You leave the cell phone. You leave the laptop. You leave, the, you leave everything. You cancel your Newsday subscription. I don't know why I get that from, but... The idea is stop reading so much of the world. Yeah, read the Bible. Read God's word and see the change. Of course, their friends are going to think you're weird. In verse 4, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. And then Ephesians chapter 5, 8 to 10, because you're getting hungry and so am I. I know you're not going to the beach. It's not beach time. Praise God. It's not even warm out. It's warmer in here. Verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. That's what I want my life to be. And guess what? It's happening. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. I want the truth. I want it about my own life. I'm not afraid of the truth. Man, when you're, when you're lying, man, you, you, you're always caught in it because you can't remember who you lied to. You say one thing to one person, another thing to another person, finally somebody's going to catch you. But to be transparent with your life before your God and to be able to have to hide nothing before man, what freedom to be able to speak from your spirit. These are the individuals that people want to hear from. They don't want to hear all this baloney from Hollywood or from the media. If there's anything that Trump did, is put the whole idea of lies right in the front page. And he's nice about it. He just says it's fake news. I say it's lies from the pits of hell. When you lie, you're lying just like the devil lies. Jesus said he lies from his own nature. He never tells the truth. He twists the truth all the time. And we live in a society which has got these kinds of things. That's why the Bible says buy the truth and sell it not. Truth is expensive because you've got to walk in it once you see it. You can't unsee once you see. And if you're listening to this message now and God has shined a light in your heart, you can't unsee what you've just seen, that you need a Savior. Only Jesus can set you free. He can set you free. He'll forgive you for your sins. And you can turn aside right now and just come to Him just the way you are and say, Jesus, help me, I'm a sinner. Please set me free. Stop the merry-go-round of confusion. Stop the merry-go-round of fear. Stop the merry-go-round of hopelessness and give me a reason to live because I don't feel there's no reason to live anymore, just a reason to die. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. How many people want that life? Stand to your feet and let's close. Hallelujah. I wrestle with these words every morning. I was up very early in the morning. But I love it. I love seeing what I see. I go to the mountaintop every morning in, in, my, in my spirit, in my thought life. But no longer am I worried about the things of the world. No longer, I don't worry about those things. Why? Because she says, don't worry. Take no thought for tomorrow. What can you do about worrying? What does worrying do, really? Nothing. Gives you more gray hair. I got enough to deal with. Okay, worrying doesn't do any good. It doesn't change one thing. But going to your Father in heaven and say, Lord, I'm not going to worry about this no more. I'm throwing it up to you. That's it. You're my Lord. I'm your servant. You're my Lord. You're my king. Take care of this. And that's it. Whatever happens, 
That's it. Thy will be done. And that's it. There is a freedom in that. I'm not worried about it. But then I live as a Christian as best I possibly can. And believe me, I'm far from perfect. Okay, hang around with me. You'll see I got some faults here and there. Okay, they might irk you and you want to hang around with me no more. That's okay. But the point is, everybody's got people that, that want to hang around with them. I happen to love the people I hang around with. I love the 20-something group that meets on Tuesday night, the Friday night group. I love my friends and I love my church. I love you so much. And I want to see you grow in faith and I want to see you grow strong so that when the winds blow, Okay, you're going to be built on a foundation. Why? The foundation is the word of God. That's why we read a lot of scriptures. Because they are living. They are actually alive and supernatural. And we started with the whole idea, some of you need a burning bush. Let me tell you something. The word of God is real. It is alive. I mean, it's not going to jump out and everything, but that word is alive. If you come aside to Jesus and say, Jesus, show me yourself in the scriptures, I can guarantee you, if you don't have your watch with you, be like a sailor. Throw your watches away. Sailors don't use watches because, you, you know, you just got to wait for the wind and the tide. So, therefore, you don't have a watch. You don't have it. But do that. Just get along with God. Or you want to be drastic like the great men and women of old did when they really are hungering for after God. Jesus said, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. You see? He told us to do these things. Be on the persistent woman who wanted justice. And she's beating on the door in the middle of the night. Jesus said, will not that unrighteous judge get up and give her whatever she wants because of her persistence? And some of us, you know, we say, oh, God, please, uh, oh, God, please heal me of this cancer. Okay, I'm going to go my way. Or, God, please heal so-and-so of this. I'm going to go my way. No, there's no passion in your life. Your mind is so jammed up with the things of this world, earth, that you could be no worldly, I know, uh, heavenly good. But let God remake your whole mind. Amen? Amen? Let's pray a prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, I heard a lot today. I heard to turn aside and that you would come and meet me. I saw that Mary chose the better part. She was willing to sit at the feet of Jesus. I want to sit at your feet, Jesus. Still my mind. Set my mind free. And Jesus, please direct my life by your word. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for all my sins. And the third day you rose from the dead. Save my soul. Grant me eternal life, O Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.